Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Grace, peace, and welcome to you on this rainy Sunday morning. Um, this is the first Sunday in the year that I've been with you when it has rained uh, in Lafayette County, to my knowledge. <laughs> I, was, I was kind of glad to see on the way down here that it does rain in Lafayette County. So we can be thankful for this, even though it is going to be a little bit slippery on the way home. If it does start to cool off and freeze, please be very careful going home. Uh, one correction to the bulletin and the announcements, it was corrected on the, on the screen, but just so we have it in paper too, the, the council meeting for December will be on the 15th, this Wednesday, not the, not the 22nd, I think we have in the, in the bulletin. So if you are on the council, uh, come this Wednesday and not next, so you don't miss it. Don't tell me that. The 15th though. <laughs> um, my confusion on the weeks is going to be settled in the new year because you know we've been doing this thing with the adult Bible study where we read a week ahead of the, um, of the text for the Sunday and that has consistently messed me up I've been living in two weeks at once and that my poor brain can't handle that so next year starting with um with the new year, we're going to be reading the same text in there that we're doing in here on that Sunday morning, so I will be less confused. Not completely unconfused, but less confused. Are there other announcements out there that need to be made that I was not aware of? I do want to say welcome to anybody who is watching us on Facebook or YouTube. We're happy to have you here over that medium. And um, with that, we'll continue beginning with our candle lighting advent this is on the screen and in your bulletin you will have a part in the middle our homes and our world are under siege television and telemarketing facebook and twitter so much information so little wisdom Angry voices call for hate. Quiet voices counsel complacency. Mechanical voices offer deals. So much information, so little wisdom. Confusion surrounds us. Truth gets lost. Where is your wisdom, O oh God? Where is the word that leads to life? Here again, the ancient story. John Zechariah's son out in the desert at the time received a message from God he went all through the country around the Jordan River preaching a baptism of life change leading to forgiveness of sin. As described in the words of Isaiah the prophet, prepare God's arrival, make God's road smooth and straight. Today we will light the first and second candles of Advent. Today is the candle of peace. As this light shines, as we listen in silence to Jew, to, to um, Cindy's prelude, think about the voices of true life change and forgiveness that are speaking in our world right now. Thank you. 
Good morning. Please join me in the morning's prayer. Holy One, you call us to turn our lives around and work patiently with you, preparing the way for you of your reign. But we get discouraged and give up too soon. You call us to work in community, but we neither trust nor honor the gifts of others. You call us to be full of joyful confidence, to prepare the way for your reign, but we burden ourselves with anxiety and fear. God have mercy. Forgive us, O oh God, and lead us in the ways of patience, community, and joy. Amen. Hear the good news. The one who saves is present with us in the painstaking work of the reign of God, forgiving our weakness, rebuilding our relationships, restoring our joy, so that we all together can say, thanks be to God. If you're able, would you please stand as we sing the second stanza of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and we'll stay standing for the hymn. Our first hymn this morning is, O Come Divine Messiah.
Our reading today is Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaint. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so the runners may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them. For the righteous live by their faith. Thank you, Dave. Continuing reading in the... Am I on now? Yeah. Continuing reading from the book of Habakkuk. <laughs> Just to prove my point from earlier, I've got the sermon for next week on my screen right now. You're just lucky I don't charge you extra for my confusion. That would be very costly. I'm going to be reading from Habakkuk 3, just um, the verses 17 through 19. This will sound familiar because we read it last week too. So the fig tree does not blossom, and no fruit is on the vine. Though the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold, and there is no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me tread upon the heights. This ends our readings for this Sunday morning. God is speaking to us through these words. When God speaks, the words are always true. We can always trust them. Would you pray with me, please? May the words that I speak and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I was out walking my dog, Ben, this morning, listening to a song by Carrie Newcomer. And it occurred to me as I was listening that the the words of her song have a kind of a sweet echo to the text that we're reading for this morning. And the first verse goes something like this, if I can remember all of it. Will you be my refuge, a haven in the storm? Um, There it goes. Anyway, the song... (laughs) The, the, the song is, is a, a, both a call to God to be that haven in the storm and the assurance that, that God will be there, to, to be the one who, who guides, comforts, reassures, doesn't always solve all the problems, unfortunately, but we know that in the midst of that, that um, God is there. She sings it much better than I can remember it, obviously. As we um, read, read last week, Habakkuk begins this oracle of his, this poem of his, with a question. And it's a pretty good question, too, I think. O Lord, he says, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not listen? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save? How long, he's asking, will the Assyrians trample across our land? How long will Babylon oppress my people? How long till we have a king worthy of the throne. That's what he's asking. God, when will this injustice end? When will you save us? And that question echoes through the ages. How long will this war go on? How long will this plague last? When will this drought end and our crops grow again? How long, God, Do we have to wait for you to do something? We heard that question echoing 
just last week in the halls of a Michigan high school. The blood of four students who died and seven others who were wounded cries out, how long will the so-called adults in this country value their guns more than they value our lives? Will it ever be safe for kids to sit in their classrooms? And even closer to home, we might be asking, how long, O Lord, till my child is well? How long will my daughter drink or my son take drugs? How long will this toxic person poison my life? How long till we realize the danger our children face from our overheating and abuse of the earth? How long till my family, my church, my community accepts me and loves me for who I am? How long, O Lord, shall I cry for help and you will not listen? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? How long? Habakkuk takes his stand on the city wall determined to find an answer. I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what God will say to me and what God will answer concerning my complaint. He is not going anywhere until he gets that answer. And he does get an answer, sort of. More just a response, really, than an answer, and certainly not what he was hoping for. God says to Habakkuk, and I really am seriously paraphrasing here, folks. God says, you're going to be waiting a while, Hab, because you're asking the wrong question. There is a vision, God tells Habakkuk, that describes the end of all this, a vision that answers that how long question, but it's not for you to know. Not yet, anyway. It will come in time. It will come on time, but not now. Be patient. Wait. Now, while you're waiting there, Hab, there on your rampart, may I suggest a different question for you to ponder? Instead of asking how long, Ask, how are we to live? Not how long, but how are we to live in this messed up country with this messed up bunch of rulers and their overzealous armies? You can assume it's going to take a while, much longer than you want. In the meantime, here's the right question. Over the long haul, how should we live? How long, apparently, isn't for us to know. How should we live? For that, God has an answer. Look at the proud, God says in verse 4 of chapter 2 that Dave read. The proud are the very messed up people ruling his messed up country and the countries all around his. They are the ones causing all the problems, in other words. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them. How long can you live with a messed up spirit? How long can a country function when the spirit of its rulers is not right? A long time, perhaps, but certainly not forever. There is a vision of the end, God says in verse 3. It will come. You'll have to wait for it, but it will come. In the meantime, and this is where the how question comes in, in the meantime, God says, the righteous will live by their faith. The righteous, those who do the right thing, whose spirit is right within them, they will live by faith, by their trust. Or to put that another way, when everything else is wrong, the righteous will do the right thing anyway because they trust that God will see them through. And if they don't get through, you know, if Hank Williams was right and nobody gets out of this world alive, the righteous will trust God anyway and continue to do the right thing. They will live while they live, trusting and acting as God's own people. That is the message of Habakkuk. How? Trust God and do the right thing. 
while the messed up rulers are messing up the country and messing up your life and messing up the planet, when the Babylonians are at the gate and the future holds home, no promise, trust and do the right thing. And God is pretty clear here in chapter 2 just what that right thing is. It means not taking what isn't yours, not taking more than you need, not building your fortune on the backs of your neighbors, getting rich by driving them into poverty. It means not trusting in Wall Street or in your 401k or in your guns or in those who think that carrying their guns in public places makes you or them safer. It means instead trusting God's abundance and letting go of your fear. That's the message. Don't be afraid. Trust God and do the right thing anyway, always, in every way, even if it costs you your life. Trust God and be righteous. Do the right thing. That's what it means to live by faith, by trust. And then, right at the end of the book, Habakkuk ratchets up the vision to a level that honestly is far beyond my reach, a level I can barely imagine, much less achieve. He is afraid. Rottenness enters my bones, he says, and my steps tremble beneath me. Nevertheless, even though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vines, even though the produce of the olive fails and the field yields no food, even though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls. In other words, when everything, all hope is lost, when there is nothing left, even then, even then, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. Now, this may seem like a strange lesson to have on the second Sunday of Advent, but it's not. In fact, this is the lesson that's told in the Advent stories of Mary and Joseph. They live out the words of Habakkuk's poem. An angel comes to Mary and asks if she will step into the stream of God's plan and bear a child. The risks were great and must have been obvious to her. In those days, an unmarried pregnant girl, much like an unwanted gay or lesbian or trans kid today, might easily have been tossed out onto the street and left to fend for herself. And she must have wondered what Joseph was going to say. But Mary steps through her fear, and even though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vine, she decides to trust. She says yes to God. But imagine, once the angel was gone and her belly began to swell, how often the fear must have returned. And Joseph against his better judgment and on the strength only of a dream, decides to trust God and do the right thing. He steps through and beyond the slander and gossip that would be his lot for the rest of his life. And even though the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no food, he will care for Mary and raise the child as his own. And when King Herod gets word of the child born in Bethlehem with a claim to the throne, when he rains terror down on the little village, Joseph must grab his family and run into the deepest darkness he has ever known. As refugees, they cross the border into a foreign land, seeking asylum from violence, seeking asylum from the madness of their homeland, seeking nothing more than a place of safety with a little child. They are fortunate. Many refugees discover that borders don't always lead to promised lands because sometimes the people who occupy the promised land are afraid. They fear there's only enough for them, not enough to share. Sometimes a border becomes a wall and hope is lost again. 
But now together, Mary and Joseph persist. And even though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls, they trust God, they do the right thing, they run for the life of the child. And forgive me for getting way ahead of the season, but you will remember this when we get to Good Friday in April. The lesson of Habakkuk is what Jesus illustrates from the cross. When with one breath he cries, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But with the next breath he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Right there, at the end of all hope, Jesus chooses to trust God. Hoping anyway, when hope is long lost. Believing, when believing makes no sense. Trusting, when trust is verifiably foolish. Even though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls, even then I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. Now, I don't know how you all feel about this, but to me, this seems a pretty tall order. I know what it is to be without hope. And I can imagine and sometimes even practice doing the right thing because it is the right thing. But trusting God through all of that, being able to rest and breathe and live through all of that, exulting in the God of my salvation when hope is lost, I'm not there very often, if ever. But fortunately for me and for you too, what Habakkuk says isn't true because I believe it. It's true because it's true. It's true because God is speaking to us through these words. And when God speaks, the words are true. We can trust them. That's why they are true. That's why we can trust them. Believing doesn't make it so, you see. God makes it so. God, the Lord, is my strength, Habakkuk says. Better be because I have no strength of my own. God the Lord is my patience when I can't wait. God the Lord is my hope when I am past hope. God the Lord is my strength. So, even though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vines, even though the produce of the olive fails and the field yields no food, even though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls, even then I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation because God the Lord is my strength. Amen. We have an invitation song to the table that we will stay seated as we sing.
as we always say, this is not the table of this church or of any church. It is the table of the Lord, and it is made ready for you. And you are welcome. If you have more faith than you need, or less than you need, you are welcome. If you come here often, or have never been here before, you are welcome. If you know Jesus well, or you've never met him before, you are welcome at this table. Whoever you are, wherever you have been, whatever brought you here this morning, you are welcome. Not because I'm inviting you, but because Jesus himself invites you. Remember, it was Jesus who said, come to me, all of you who labor under heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and gentle of spirit, and here at this table you will find rest for your soul. Pray with me, please. Holy God, we praise and bless you for the creation, for the gift of life, for your abiding love. For you are the source of all that is good. We thank you for calling us to walk together in the way of Jesus, for breathing this new life into us. And we thank you for this bread of life and cup of salvation, offering to us the very presence of Christ. Bless us now in our eating and drinking that our eyes may be opened and we may recognize the living Christ at this table, in each other, and in all for whom Christ died. Amen. I long for the day when this will not be necessary. And like Habakkuk said, that day is coming. Not yet, but it's coming. We remember at this table that night when Jesus sat at a table like this with his friends just before they betrayed him, before his enemies arrested him, Remember, he took a loaf of bread, and he gave thanks for that bread, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, take, eat. This is my body. It is for you. When you eat, remember me. And after supper, he took a cup of wine. He poured out the cup, and he gave that to his friend, saying, take, drink. This cup is my blood of the covenant. This cup makes possible a new, a lasting relationship between you and me. When you drink, remember me. We come to this table in faith and in hope, proclaiming as we do what is the mystery of our faith, that Christ has died, but Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. These are the gifts of God for you, my friends, the people of God. So come to the table. Everything is now ready. This morning, um, we'll stand in front of the pulpit. I will hand you a small piece of bread, and the wine and juice will be in the trays. The wine is red, the juice is white, and you can choose which cup you want to have out of there and take the wine and the bread back to your seat and um, leave the cup in the tray holder in front of you. So please, everything is ready, please come.
Pray with me, please. Gracious God, we rejoice in the generosity of this table, the sufficiency of this bread and this wine. We rejoice in the presence of Jesus who is with us as we gather together as his body in this place on this day. For these gifts, we thank you and we praise you always in Jesus' name. Amen. Now is a time in our service when we open to anybody who has a request for prayer or something that they would like to talk about that has given them something to rejoice over this week. Dave, would you be so kind as to... Anybody for whom we are praying or anything? Rod? Hold the mic as close as you can so everybody online can hear you too. Good. I want to thank my uh, son-in-law, John Drum, from California to be with me for a few days here. Nice to have you. Oh, yes, we have a prayer for the family of Becky Burris, who passed away two days ago. Becky Burris? Is that the, the person who's related to Pam Hart? I got a phone call this morning from Betty Williams, who's not here, obviously. Uh, she said she wasn't feeling well. She has something like a flu, she said. She went to the doctor, though, so I'm sure they're checking her for other things, too. But she hopes to be back next week. But we don't want to keep her in our prayers as well. Anything else? Hmm? Women's Guild meets this coming Thursday for their Christmas party at, in Fellowship Hall. Okay. What time will that be? At, at noon this Thursday. Okay. Thank you. Let's hold these things in prayer and then um, conclude with the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Please pray with me. Gracious God, you know the concerns that we brought into this room with us this morning, the people that we have lost and will mourn, those who are sick, who we hope will recover, those who are uncertain of the course that their life will take. And God, you hear all the concerns we do not speak out loud, knowing that you will hold them close to your own heart. So grant to us as well, gracious God, the assurance of your presence, the assurance that all things, all of us, are always in your hands, always in your care and keeping. And hear us as we pray together the words Jesus taught us when he said, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> I have another Advent poem for you for our offering time. Um, this one comes from one of my very favorite poets, Mary Oliver. And the poem is called Making the House Ready for the Lord. That's Ben up there on the screen. You'll, you'll see why he's in on the screen in just a moment. <clears throat> Dear Lord, I have swept and I have washed, but still nothing is as shining as it should be for you. 
Under the sink, for example, is an uproar of mice. It is the season of their many children. What shall I do? And under the eaves and through the walls, the squirrels have gnawed their ragged entrances. But it is the season when they need shelter. So what shall I do? And the raccoon limps into the kitchen and opens the cupboard while the dog snores. The cat hugs the pillow. What shall I do? Beautiful is the new snow falling in the yard and the fox who is staring boldly up the path to the door. And still, I believe you will come, Lord. You will come when I speak to the fox, the sparrow, the lost dog, the shivering sea goose. You will know that I really am speaking to you whenever I say, as I do all morning and all afternoon, come in, come in. That measure of gratitude is reflected, I think, in the way that this church cares for, for its own operation with the generosity that shows up in the offering plate or in the mail or online. Uh, that plate is still at the back of the room, so on your way out, if you haven't given your gift for this week, you can do so. And we thank you for that generosity. Um, let's stand together to sing the doxology, and we'll stay standing for the closing hymn. Please stand if you're able. Oh, yeah, I should pray, shouldn't I? <clears throat> Join me in this prayer. With these gifts, dear God, accept the praise and thanksgiving of our hearts as we rejoice in your goodness and love. Let our gifts be evidence of your presence in the world to further your dream for a world made whole, through Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Closing hymn this morning is Let There Be Light, Lord God of Hosts. Go into the world and keep awake. The time is near when God's hope will be revealed. Go into the world and keep watch. The signs of God's light are breaking out around us. Go into the world to nurture hope for justice and peace this day and always. 
Go into this world, my friends, to serve the Lord. Amen.